using a bent iron spearhead. And the best spearhead of all was one which had been used to kill a gladiator. Gladiators were sometimes seen as symbols of virility, so perhaps this custom was viewed as a way to ensure a fertile union. The bride then donned a veil of transparent fabric that was bright orange or reddish in color, which her shoes matched. Her tunic was white, and she placed a wreath of marjoram on her head. In front of a gathering of friends and relatives, various sacrifices were performed, and the woman declared to her husband, I am now of your family, at which point their hands were joined. This was followed by a feast at which the new bride and groom sat side by side in two chairs over which was stretched a single sheepskin. At the feast, it was customary for the guest to shout feliciter, which means happiness or good luck. Towards the end of the evening, the bride was placed in the arms of her mother, and then the groom came and tore her out of her mother's grasp. All of this occurred at the bride's house. But then the bride, groom, and guests marched to the bride's new home, the home of her husband. As they moved through the streets in a torch-lit procession, the guests threw nuts and shouted, Talasio, a traditional Roman wedding acclamation dating back to the rape of the Sabine women. And often they would sing ribald or suggestive songs. When they reached the groom's house, the bride tossed into the crowd a special torch known as the wedding torch, and whoever managed to catch it was supposed to enjoy long life. Since this torch was presumably still flaming when it was thrown, this was no doubt a dramatic moment and makes our modern parallel custom of the bride throwing her bouquet to the crowd seem a bit tame in comparison. The bride then rubbed oil and fat on the doorposts of the house, and her new husband then picked her up and carried her over the threshold. Once inside, she symbolically touched fire and water, indicating that she was now the guardian of the hearth. In the entry hall was placed a miniature marriage bed intended for the spirits of the bride and groom. And after the fire and water ceremony, the new couple went off to their marriage bed. Now, keep in mind, none of these elaborate rites were necessary to make a marriage binding. It was the statement of intent which actually made a marriage legal. But performing some or all of these rituals was common practice. The main duty of the wife was to produce children. But because some were married before they were physically mature, not surprisingly, many young wives died of complications during childbirth. One of the main sources of information on Roman women is their tombstones. And many of these record the sad stories of girls who were married at 12 or 13, gave birth five or six times, and then died in childbirth before they reached the age of 20. These tombstones are also the best guide to what Roman men considered the ideal qualities of a wife. Some of the most common positive attributes used by husbands to describe their deceased wives include chaste, obedient, friendly, old-fashioned, frugal, content to stay at home, pious, dressed simply, good at spinning thread, and good at weaving cloth. Conversely, one way that men were praised on their tombstones was to say that they treated their wives kindly, with the implication that such kindness was not necessary and was perhaps even unusual. If in a monos marriage the husband could beat his wife with impunity, and was expected to do so if she misbehaved. In one famous instance, a man beat his wife to death because she took a drink of wine, and all his friends and family approved, since her action, to them at least, was a clear sign of immorality. 
During the Republic, regardless of the type of marriage, a husband could kill his wife if she was caught committing adultery. This was eventually outlawed, but husbands were still allowed to kill their wives if they found them in the house having sex with someone of a lower status. A father could kill his daughter if he caught her committing adultery as long as he killed or at least tried to kill her lover at the same time. Divorce was just as easy as marriage. All a couple had to do was declare that they were getting divorced, and they were. There was often pressure for women to remarry, especially if they were still of prime childbearing age. In the early empire, a law was enacted that decreed if a woman was between the ages of 20 and 50 and got divorced, she had to marry again within six months. If her husband had died, she was granted longer for mourning, but she still had to get remarried within one year. Generally speaking, a woman was supposed to spend most of her time within the confines of the household. When upper-class women did venture out of the house to visit the marketplace, the baths, temples, or female friends, they were often transported in curtained litters carried by slaves, both to avoid the filth in the streets and to stay concealed and unseen in public. Women were supposed to be modest and chaste. A Roman matron's clothing was intended to cover her completely, and statues frequently depict women making a specific gesture meant to communicate their pudicidia or modesty. Fidelity to one's husband was crucial. The Republican ideal of womanhood called for frugal frugality, industriousness, restraint, piety, self-effacement, obedience to one's husband, and the ability to control one's emotions and maintain a stoical demeanor. It was considered wrong for a woman to be avaricious, ambitious, ostentatious, or self-promoting. Husbands and wives were obligated to produce children, but there often seems not to have been a lot of affection between them. Marriage was seen as a social and political relationship, not a romantic one. Some of this lack of warmth was no doubt due to the fact that many Roman men and women did not themselves choose their spouses, and frequently there was a vast age difference between them. Upper-class married couples did not typically share a bed. Instead, both husband and wife had their own suite of rooms and their own servants in different parts of the house. This remoteness seems to have led to a certain degree of resentment on the part of at least some Roman wives. An example of this occurred when there was a rash of aristocratic deaths at Rome. Upon investigation, it was discovered that many of the wives were poisoning their husbands. Some of the women claimed that they had been trying to give their husbands aphrodisiacs to make them fall in love with them, and the aphrodisiacs unfortunately turned out to be toxic. Whether this was truly their motivation, or if they were simply getting revenge on their unfaithful husbands, 170 women were convicted of poisoning. However, there was a degree of divergence between the ideal behavior of wives and the reality. Some women did commit adultery and sometimes divorced their husbands in order to marry others. Especially towards the end of the Republic, a few notable women who were either married or related to powerful men were even able to have an impact on politics and government and to exercise power. During this period, one woman named Hortensia, the daughter of a famous orator, had, despite her gender, been given an elaborate education, including philosophy and rhetoric. In 42 BC, she delivered a compelling speech in the Roman Forum, arguing for a change in a law that was negatively affecting women. So polished was her oratory that she won her case. Around the same time, Mark Antony's wife, Fulvia, was an active partner in his career, manipulating politics at Rome and raising legions on his behalf. 
She even seems to have taken a direct role in guiding the defense of a city under siege. Comparatively little is known about the lives of lower class women who had to work outside the home in order to help support their families or themselves. They might work as vendors in the marketplace or learn a trade such as cloth making or perfume manufacture. Women also commonly served as midwives and as wet nurses in wealthy families. While women could not act on stage in theatrical productions, they could perform in mime and pantomime shows and as musicians, although all these careers imparted a shady reputation. Particular notoriety surrounded women who worked as innkeepers, waitresses, bartenders, maids, and cooks. There seems to have been an expectation that many of these workers would combine their duties with prostitution. And indeed, there are surviving bills from inns at which the itemized list includes charges for food, lodging, and the sexual services of the maids. Although prostitutes were looked down upon, prostitution itself was legal and was one of the careers open to poor women. Contact with the public sphere in whatever capacity seems to have compromised a woman's reputation. There's a great deal about Roman women's lives that we would like to know more about, but the biggest gap is how they viewed themselves. The surviving sources tell us much about how Roman men wanted them to think and behave, but sadly, it's much harder to perceive their own opinions. Nevertheless, there are traces, such as the material relating to Eumachi of Pompeii, that remarkable businesswoman of the first century AD, that occasionally help to round out the picture and give a more complete and nuanced portrait of their lives. Since to the Romans, one of the most significant roles of women was producing children, in the next lecture, let's examine the lives of Roman boys and girls and consider the educational opportunities available to them.